let me tell you the way the world is. Nothing works right. Relationships don't work right. People don't work right. People make podcasts. So why should Zombie Takeout be perfect? Welcome to episode 428 of Zombie Ticket, the B-Movie and Cult Movie Show. I'm John. And hello, I'm Scotto. Before we get to this week's movie, we've got some voicemail from Bodo. Bodo left this for last week's episode because we didn't announce that we were switching to Outland until the last minute. So he wishes us a happy Halloween, just wanted to explain that. John, Scotto, it's Bodo here. Happy Halloween. Hope you guys had a great day. Oh, days with the blue moon. Run right away. Uh, that's weird. Quality. Uh, pretty much foretold the future except for everybody smoking everywhere, which, you know, never happens nowadays. Uh, not bad. Not good. But the only good thing that came out of this is when I looked it up on YouTube, I got to watch a documentary with Joan Jett and the Runaways. So that was the I read this movie about two brains, maybe. If I had half a brain, I'd be twice as smart as I am now. Love you guys. You guys are the best. Have great holidays. Peace out. Thank you, Bodo, and Thanks, you're welcome. And you're welcome for the documentary, or for leading you to it. <laughs> right, and of course we had to switch out last week. So I mean, Sean Connery passing yeah. was like of a. Course. You had to do a Connery know, tribute, and all hands on deck. <laughs> yeah, and good call on that one. You picked uh, Outland. Yeah, yeah, I was I was worried, of course, you know, we kind of like roll the dice with some mm-hmm. of these tributes, but yeah. that 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 one actually was a success. Mm-hmm. And on to this week's movie, which is from 1984, Runaway. Of course, that brings us to the impromptu plot summary, sponsored by rock stars. They're actually not actors, no matter how intimidating they look. And also brought to you by the Runaway Squad, for when you just don't feel like shutting off your own damn computer. All right, uh, so we are in... They don't have a placard that tells us we're the future, but you kind of figure out... Soon enough, this is the future. It was um, pleasantly low on exposition. Yeah, yeah, it was. Uh, everyone has a uh, a robot in their home. Um, not just an Alexa, but a robot that actually does shit. Um, and which, of course, we're still we're still heading towards. I oh, think yeah, we'll Crichton, get there. Crichton probably thought we'd have been there by now, mm. and and we're really close, but not quite. Yeah, this was uh, written and directed by Michael Crichton, who wrote Jurassic Park, just to get that bit of trivia out there. And uh, so the, the the trouble is, of course, uh, there's a hacker, mm-hmm. and um, he somehow gains access to people's robots um, and puts a chip into them, and they wind up becoming killer robots, uh, so much so that the battle bot can wield a gun. Um. <laughs> well, I, I, that confused me for a bit until I realized that robot was designed to do things around the house, particularly open doors. So it is probably pretty articulated. Sure, sure. <laughs> you know, enough to fire a gun. Um, and uh, you don't expect out of the, one of those low running back no, robots no. to be able to fire a gun, though. It was basically an oversized um, rat droid with yeah. a hand. It was a Roomba with arms, pretty much. Mm-hmm. Um, so uh, we have our, our cop who has a new partner, uh, but it's kind of weird because they don't act like they've just met. They just kind of, he goes in, he starts out as this, you know, just, okay, we're on the case. We're, mm-hmm. we're doing this stuff and, you know, you know, keep up with me sort of thing. And then he kind of gets into this, weird thing with her and uh <laughs> is he into her or is he not into her <sighs> she's into him but 
you know, he doesn't get she's into him and he's trying to keep it professional, but he's not trying to keep it too professional. And it's just, um, and again, I say, <sighs> can you, can you hear me rubbing my temples while I'm yeah. trying to explain this? And I don't even mind romantic subplots, yeah, but this yeah. one was fucking annoying. If it's irritating <laughs> you, <laughs> um, he's also a, uh, single father, a widower, um, when you realize that, and he's a cop, and he's going into these dangerous situations, and uh, it's never—it's kind of treated as an exciting thing, and not a "Hey, you could have yourself an orphan there." Mm-hmm. <laughs> it, it was kind of like a oh, weird, all right. Yeah. But um, and the annoying so, kid actor who was limited to one scene last week had what two or three this time? He had about two or three. I don't think he was quite as annoying as last week's kid actor oh god no way worse to me <laughs> um i mean he kind of likes razzing his father a little bit that was a bit more realistic hmm. um but uh right so he has a robot himself that pretty much is taking care of the parenting while he is out uh unexploded hmm. yeah. you know bombs and shit and likes to play who's on first <laughs> Yeah. So, um, of course, they he figures out the plot right away, and he's after this guy, and uh, they they cat and mouse each other for a while. They're literally on a uh, a highway of uh, battle bots trying to blow up their car, and um, well, I I mean, it's obvious he has vertigo. So, of hmm. course, where does one think the climax of this will be? Uh, of course. Uh, we should have said, uh, you know, based on a song by Iron and Wine, you know, mm-hmm. such great big heights. Mm-hmm. But Alfred Hitchcock works better. Yeah. Um, so they have the big showdown high up in the sky. Uh, some idiot put a an elevator control panel underneath the elevator. And hilarity ensues. Yeah. And one thing I did like was how there was action during the opening credits. That was nice. We didn't have to sit through an opening credits sequence. Speaking of the opening credits, always nice to see G.W. Belly's name pop up. <laughs> I'm like, wait a minute. I first, first, I thought he was Captain Mauser, but no, that was from like the later <laughs> yeah. Police Academies. But no, Lieutenant Harris. Uh, and he's actually playing a police captain. Yeah. And I had to look up, like, was this before Police... But no, this is the same year right. Police Academy came out. Right. But I, I just like G. Bell, G. W. Bell as an actor. He's just great yeah. in everything he does. He's played uh, a lot of cops. Yeah. Well, I mean, he's kind of that type. Yeah. Um, and, you know, the first call they go out on is to this farm to take care of these pest control robots that looked a lot like Tonka trucks, if you're old enough yeah. to remember Tonka trucks. Um and the scene where they were chasing them down was basically like chasing a pig. Right. Um, but I did like how the movie kind of just subtly showed that robots are commonplace and use, instead of using this big, long expositional monologue. Yeah, it's a little jarring at first. You're kind of like, wait a minute, is this some sort of special, you know, thing? And then you realize, nope, mm-hmm. this is just uh, the future. Yeah. And then within the first 10 minutes, we go from this cute scene where they're chasing this, you know, Tonka truck looking robot on a farm like it's a pig to this robot that's killed two people and is threatening an infant. Right. And I'm not sure, (laughs) you know, there's so many problems with that scene. Mm -hmm. Um, First off, the guy is a robotics person himself. Yeah, the father. Yes. Why Why would he have somebody fixing his robot for him? Yeah. You know, I mean... Building a robotic daughter. Anyway. My brother-in-law is a programmer. (laughs) My brother-in-law is a computer programmer. He's not going to have some other guy come in Uh and fuck with his shit. (laughs) Right. (laughs) This robotics guy who has robots in his home is not going to say, oh, yeah, let's call in a professional that will pay to fix... Because that's kind of what it was, and you know, like Gene kinda... Shimon Thompson, as if he's like mm. just the maintenance guy. I kind of got the impression. Didn't he work for the company, though? Yes, yes, he did. 
So, I mean, maybe he just got the chip on the cheap. Well, no, because we saw the footage of Simmons showing up at the door as the repair guy. Right. That was the thing. They called the repair guy, or no, they they didn't call a repair guy. He showed up as if he were a repair guy, mm-hmm. and they just let him in mm-hmm. and planted the right. you know kill, murder chip in the uh, in the robot, which I don't know. <laughs> but in <laughs> that scene that where sense. they're trying to stop the robot before it kills the kid, um, I like the ear music behind like the floater camera scene. Although they could have named that better than the floater camera. <laughs> It was a flying camera. Well, it was a drone. It's a drone. Mm-hmm. And it's very very much nails yeah, yeah. how a drone's going to be, which True. is kind of surprising. It's like a few propellers shy. Yeah. But, I mean, imagine 10 years from now, yeah. drones are going to have fewer propellers anyway. So. Right, right, right. Um, and also, Sim, that's the first time we see Simmons in that scene. Doesn't yes. have any dialogue. and I, no. And I thought, okay, he does play a good villain. Right. Until he had dialogue. <laughs> right. He he has the stare that works really well. And then when he talks, it's like he's a step more intimidating than Gilbert Godfrey. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, also, the news crew in that scene are incredibly stupid. I mean, I yes. know if it, lead, if, if it bleeds, it leads. But that was a bit too much. Um, they have a robot on the loose with a gun. In the house, he tells the crew, "You're, you know, it can hear your broadcasting because it's electromagnetic spectrum." They continue to broadcast, and they even send a camera guy into the house. Right, and then, no oh, spoiler alert: the camera guy dies. Of course, I was very happy about that. But they don't even like. He doesn't even call for help or anything once he gets the robot neutralized. Mm-hmm. It, it's just, oh, I'm coming out with the kid. Like, wait a minute. Um, didn't you guys see the camera feed of the caravan dying? Oh, one quick note about Simmons. Um, in his book, Sex, Money, Kiss, Simmons said that director Michael Crichton's casting of him was based primarily on an audition where Crichton asked Simmons to stare at him for about a minute without making any facial expressions. <laughs> Apparently Crichton decided that Simmons looked menacing enough and cast him as Luther. I mean, you should have to run some lines. I mean, it was yeah. it was like, why, why is Luke Costello wearing a wig? <laughs> there was a bit in Voda's voicemail that I couldn't decipher. It sounded like something about a wig. <laughs> I couldn't quite understand what he was saying, but I think he did say something about a wig. Um, I don't know. I mean, that most likely wasn't... I, I doubt it was a wig. No, I think that was knows. just his hair. Who knows? Mm. And, as I mentioned before, I did not like this movie as a kid, and I don't think it was for the, the reasons I didn't like it. I, I don't like it now. <laughs> but I am rather surprised that it's a sci-fi movie with robots and a laser gun that I didn't like. Yeah. And a guided just... missile gun. I dig the guided missile gun. It, they, there's so much more they could have done. I think, and of course, the problem with it now is that uh, it's just such a predictable movie that mm-hmm. you can pretty much tell exactly what's going to happen yeah. in the movie right? way before it happens. Mm-hmm. Back to G.W. Belly, one of his first scenes in the movie, he owns with one word. They're working <laughs> on this robot. It blows up just as his partner comes in. Then, you know, he grabs her. They hit the deck. The robot goes boom. They cut to Belly outside of the office. He just says, assholes. <laughs> owned that scene with just one word. Also, when they go to the construction site, then the next call, they have to go to a construction site where there's this right. stacker robot who is that's dropping these like giant bags of concrete. And and Jack, Selleck's character, doesn't want to go up the elevator because he's scared of heights. And he's standing really close to where the stacker is dropping these bags of concrete. I mean, it's it's not going wild. It's not chaotic. It's dropping them in the same spot every time. But he's... Standing close enough for the impact to get him. To cover him in dust. And, you know, if there is a little variance, he could get hit. Sure. There's a lot of... I I think Selleck started out 
with a strong performance, I mm-hmm. felt. Like, mm-hmm. I believed him as a cop. Right. But as the movie went on, you could see he was just lost in yeah. the script. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and direction, really. Because the director would be like, no, you'd stand away from it. Or, like, when he's just neutralizing the robot in the house uh, from, from, you know, the, the to save the kid, mm-hmm. he stood with the robot between his legs. Yeah, yeah. Like, the robot holding the gun. Between he stood over. Yeah. Between his legs. I say my notes, the gun goes off between his legs, roll credits, the greatest <laughs> movie ever made. Right. This was Creighton's last science fiction film. I didn't even know he directed films. I know him as a writer. Yeah, I didn't either. I, you know, in fact, I didn't realize he directed this. So I thought it was like his story. Mm. But as much as I'm saying I appreciate the lack of exposition, the film does pretty much give you its mission statement um jack has this big monologue about how you know people are imperfect so machines are imperfect too the line you took for your intro yes it's basically the mission statement of the movie right yeah it was just kind of odd that they just can handed it to us also luther says he's working when he shows up as the repair guy he shows he's working says he's working for acme robot repairs i got a kick out of that <laughs> It just seemed like the big picture was handled very well in this movie, but the details mm-hmm. are really lacking. Yeah, yeah. Like uh, the heat seeking gun. Mm-hmm. It looks really cool. Yeah. How does one control that? Well, apparently you program it ahead of time. I'm not exact. Maybe you plug uh, exactly. it in. Exactly. It's got to have like a USB on. Or, or, no, back then it would have been like serial. Right, they're, so they're talking about you can put it to specifically one person's mm-hmm. body heat. How does one pick up one person's, you know, signature? And, I mean, it was nice at the end of the, the heat that could mess up with the, the so it wasn't just like, no. you, know, you know, an imperfect weapon, you know, that yeah. could just, you know. But, you know, how would one control that gun? <laughs> Yeah, I, I don't know how you program it on the fly. That's odd. Also, okay, so the the bug droids that are so common in the film, apparently they they hit you with acid. Right. But the first time we see them attack someone, they jump on them. They look like they inject the person in their chin, and then the person bursts into flames. <laughs> Did the acid burst into flames? Because that's two different chemical reactions entirely. I don't know. And Tom Selleck got stabbed with one, and nothing really happened. I mean, his face got messed up, but uh, he got it in the hand, didn't he? Oh, that's right. He did. Yeah. Yeah. Nothing happened. Um, yeah, he's able to like catch, you know, a pole and like hang and just let me, and then pull himself up. Yeah. <laughs> it's kind of like, oh, so it's not like he's injured at all now but the first guy that gets attacked by them he's injected with acid and he bursts into flames <laughs> that's i'm just not sure how that works um i will say that i think the most compelling movie in the actor in the movie was the voice of the vectorcon computer oh the uh you know they go He's he's checking the vector con the the company that makes the the chips that are causing the robots to become killers. He's going through their systems and he talks to this tech nearby about the voice of the computer and how it's so lifelike. It just kind of amused me that they're making a big deal about the voice of this computer. I'm thinking also of how how bad Alexa really is. Yeah. yeah. Holy fuck. You know mm-hmm. what when. when at first, you're kind of like, oh, are they listening to us and, and, you know, recording everything we say and whatnot? And then you actually try to use the Alexa, and it doesn't understand shit. <laughs> I have a Google Home. I use it a, I've used it a few times. I don't use it on a regular, but it, it seems okay. Um, I, I just have an Alexa in my, mm-hmm. you know, my Fire Stick, and it's just like, what? You want to look for it? <laughs> it's like way off. Oh, I've tried to use the voice on my TV, and I, it it doesn't work. Siri on the computer, same deal. doesn't work great. I'm not big on talking to devices. I'd much rather type, so. Yeah, same here. 
Um, so that's all I would think about when they're you're talking about the voice of the computer. Mm-hmm. In this, although just after that, with the first we've seen, we meet Jackie, Chris Kirsty Alley's character. He, you know, there's a runaway off a runaway robot in an office um, that he ends up taking out with a chair. <laughs> I got a kick out of that. And yeah, it's just that whole scene too, where suddenly he's like, "Wow, she's attractive and stuff." It was like, "Wait, what the hell is going on here now?" Mm. Although. In that same scene, I, I, I have to wonder why Kirstie Alley actually had a career given her acting. <laughs> I mean, yeah, she was attractive, but her acting, why? <laughs> then we finally get a real scene with G.W. Bailey, uh, the chief, or the yeah. captain, about 50 minutes in. I mean, it's the cliche, you know, I've got you know X amount of time till retirement police captain scene, but still, it was fun. The, the angry, you know captain yeah i can't believe you guys it's like wait a minute you didn't have any backup there yeah (laughs) what the hell and you're blaming him for him getting away Mm -hmm. and as much as simmons performance underwhelmed me i have to say i gained a lot of respect for cynthia rhodes as an actor she plays his partner she was really good yeah yeah and i i think she (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I think that the two of them could have been pretty good, you know, mm-hmm. if they had a director and a script that made yeah. sense. I mean, I generally like um, Selleck as an actor, you know. Yeah. I was prepared to like him in the film. Um, yeah, but he did go a little off the rails because of probably Crichton, Crichton's direction. Well, right. I, I, like, just having that line of, like, oh, like, oh you're like, She's attractive and <laughs> like, oh, I'm going to go and do something stupid and try to get the robot, you know, myself. Yeah. None of oh, that made any sense. Yeah. Uh, uh, but then you like that he's he gets back to playing detective or interrogator right. and you realize what he's doing where he's trying to uh, get stuff out of her. Mm. Also, Stan Shaw, who played Marvin, is kind of second banana in the office. Um, another cop. Had a, has had a very interesting career, with the exception of 2001 to 2012 for some reason. He's worked steadily since 74, but never really developed a name. I mean, I know huh. I've seen him in a ton of other things, but I would never know his name. You kind of wish he had more in this, actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm, I'm sure there are people who see his name and react like I do when I see G.W. Bailey. But, you know, he's one of those actors who's just worked a ton, but you you never really hear about I mean, one of the scenes that they he, he was in that was a huge what the fuck because uh-huh. they were playing around with the missile, mm-hmm. the, the mini missile, right? Just fucking barehanded, just putting you know, like. Well, they froze it and they it. cut it open, freezing it and cutting it open, lighting up, uh, putting a lighter up in front of it. Mm-hmm. It's just like, wait, what? <laughs> Guys, that's an explosive. No one's wearing any protective gear or anything. Yeah, there was a remarkable lack of protection in this film. Gloves to go over a crime scene. That there was there was nothing. They they go into this scene where they're they're um stopping a, a meeting between Luther and a bunch of other people. And no Kevlar. Uh, yeah, I'm not even sure what that meeting was supposed to be. What was he? he Some was kind he... of arms deal I figured. With, like, prostitutes? Yeah. Like, I mean, what, what was that? But, you know, they're, they're, they're getting in the way of this meeting, this arms deal, I, I, I figured. Um, yeah. No Kevlar, no... She gets shot with the, you know, miss, heat-seeking gun, bullet. Fortunately, it doesn't go off and blow her arm off. It just It's a dud. But, uh, you know... It, well, not a dud, but it just didn't trigger. Um, but, yeah, shouldn't there have been Kevlar involved? <laughs> Oh yeah, totally. Because he wore something to go into the uh, into the house, yeah, right? To try right. try to to be protected against that, mm-hmm. and and here it was just, oh yeah, we're just gonna go in. I'm like, wait, what? <laughs> <laughs> also, they suddenly, for some reason, crowbar a psychic in. Um, you know, he's arguing with the the captain and about the case, and the captain insists that he talk to one of their psychics. 
Yeah, I think that Creighton believes that's what we'll do in the future, too. I don't know. <sighs> Again, I sigh. <laughs> and and uh, I like the, the psychic was doing the bullshit. Uh, Luke? Mm-hmm. It's an old name. Yeah. <laughs> Lucifer? Going down L names. Lucifer. And actually, the only thing I remembered from when I saw this movie as a kid, when I was like 12 or 13, was the scene when Jackie, Kirstie Alley's character, is getting scanned for the bugs, and she <laughs> had to strip. Literally the only thing I remember. <laughs> I did like the car chase with the, the lock-on robots. That was nicely done. And, and I guess it is realistic that they wouldn't give him enough people to protect them. Right. <laughs> Since they, they really didn't give it a backup in the first place. Mm. And, you know, the bit with the elevator and the climax was a nice take on Vertigo. <laughs> but why would the panel be under the elevator? <laughs> uh, yeah, I, it was a nice <laughs> tense action scene. I, I, I did enjoy that. I, and as someone who was also af- afraid of heights, it, it definitely tensed me up. All I think of is Galaxy Quest. Who would put that there? <laughs> hmm. And then at the end, of course, he kills Luther. But yeah. then, you know, he goes down to examine the body to make sure he's dead. I was going to say, wait a minute. He doesn't kill Luther. Well, no. Well, he Luther facilitates lacks, Luke Luther's death. Luther lacks, um, what's it called? The very simple thing when you're dealing with deadly things. Or computers hmm. and override. Yeah. Right. You think somebody that would be that smart <laughs> would have a little remote that would just okay, you know, stop them. But Luther's laying there after getting t- killed by the dro- the bug droids. Uh, Jack reaches down to make sure he's dead. He just kind of springs up, hisses, and then falls back down dead. <laughs> it was just ridiculous. <laughs> with all that acid pumped into him yeah and <laughs> what <laughs> and then of course at the end they had to crowbar in the romantic subplot fuck they didn't just crowbar it in we had to watch the make out over the credits yes yeah, yeah, i skipped most of that <laughs> with the sparks coming down of the back like it was a metal video yeah by the way, it was and, set in 91 based on Ramsey's age, which was revealed um, in his birth year, which was on a computer screen. Um, wow, I, I knew it was too soon set, you know? Yeah. But the other thing about the makeout scene at the end, think about that. They are just feet away from a dead body <laughs> and possible killer robots that can yeah. still be left mm-hmm. operational. Yeah, they killed Luther. They weren't deactivated. Right. So, yeah. Um, that, that was just, it was just that kind of attention to detail in the movie that was kind of like, why wouldn't they think of that? Why would they just be like, oh, mm-hmm. it's all over now. Yeah. Let's get it on. <laughs> like, like, practically next to his corpse. <laughs> yeah. Like, literally, like, maybe two feet away. Yes. Hope there are no dead killer robots still alive here. <sighs> and and he Man. had just sprung up and hissed weirdly. Well, even though he was dead. <sighs> I think it would have a brain and a half if, like, in the middle of that makeout session, a robot <laughs> springs oh, up. Yes, yes. And, like, the movie comes back on, interrupting the credits of them fighting off robots. I would put it on the rec list. Or I would <laughs> recommend it if they had done that. Totally, Savior. Okay, no sequels or remakes, of course. Um, Underbrains? Underbrains. Yeah, I was hovering between a two and a half and a three for most of the movie. Then that ending happened, and it's down to a two. I'm right there with that. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I think I'm, I'm pretty close to you. Cause I'll give it the half just for seeing a lot of where robotics are going to be in the future. Mm. But, uh, yeah, you need to be able to write a script and direct <laughs> a movie, though, and cast a, a capable actor to play your villain. Yeah. Two, and, two and, a and a half. Yeah, okay. And what have we learned? We learned that uh, Jake Simmons should have never taken that makeup off. <laughs> ever. 
what the fuck was he thinking to take that makeup mm. off? And I learned that GW Valley, actually I learned a couple of things, GW Valley can own a scene with just one word, and I could happily go for the rest of my life without seeing another child actor perform. <laughs> Think of how great this movie would have been if Steve Gutenberg were in it, though. Oh, yeah. And, and, and uh, Winslow, you know? The... Well, yeah, Michael Winslow would be <laughs> all the, you know, all the you know, robot noises. He could have been the villain. Oh, yes. And doing the voices of you know, the, all the computer noises. Yeah. That would have been five easily. Yes. All right. That's it for Runaway. Until next time, we'll be reviewing Lust for Freedom back on our B-movie bullshit for arguably the rest of the year. Yeah. Depending on whether you consider Hackers a B-movie, it's debatable. I do. Mm. <laughs> Until then, of course, always remember, never forget, wherever you go in life. There you are. There you are.